All right, hello everyone. Today we're reading chapter eight. Before we start, let's go over what happened in chapter seven. So in chapter seven, Pop explains that he kept his Indian ancestry hidden from Cal to protect Cal from bigotry. Okay, what does bigotry mean? So bigotry means unreasonably disliking or being mean to someone because they are different than you. All right, so I'm gonna ask a question about the definition of bigotry. So write this down. Um, next, he explains that he, this is Pop when they say he. So Pop explains that he intends to march on Washington with other veterans and that Cal will be safer if he enrolls in the Chilagi boarding school instead. All right, so now we're going to read chapter eight, which is called Gunshots. Chapter eight, gunshots. Most folks, Pop says, when they hear the sound of a gun, turn and run. Soldiers run too, but they go toward the sound of the guns. Stay back of me, Pop says. Leaving the pot and cups behind us, we start running. There's a way to run a trail through the woods at night, Pop taught me. Don't run headlong, jog along, feeling the path under your feet. Don't just look down toward your feet. Look up. There's a faint line of light above the length of a trail, especially when the moon is bright. No more shots. That might be good. But when we begin to see the light from a fire ahead of us, it's burning much bigger than a cooking fire. That's not good. We pause at the edge of the clearing, staying low to the ground. We're behind the trees, faces not lit by the fire. A man's face is the first thing an enemy sees. Just putting your head down and not looking up makes it hard for anyone to notice you. It would have been better if we darkened our faces with mud. No time for that. But leaning forward, long hair falling over our faces is almost as good a way to hide eyes and cheeks that might reflect back the light. Pop and I are unseen, but what we are seeing isn't good. The clearing is so well lit because of the fire consuming one of the wooden shelters. Not caps, at least not yet. Armed men with torches have invaded the hobo jungle, once holding a hound by a leash. That explains how they found their way here. They've lined up all the bows, forced them to kneel with their hands behind their heads. That first shot was likely fired into the air as a warning. I am just about certain who pulled the trigger. It's the mean-faced man in the black suit. He's sporting a big badge on his chest, holding what looks like a forty-five. He raises it high above his head, points it at the half-moon. Where is he? The man with the gun says. Where are you hiding that? Blam! He fires another round up into the sky. Some of the kneeling men cower lower, but not Cap. He's looking straight at the man with the gun. That is a right nice weapon you have got there, Sheriff, Cap says. Y'all want a closer look? The Sheriff says, in an even voice that's a heavy with menace. He lowers the gun, presses it against Cap's forehead, and pulls back the hammer with his thumb. This time, Cap says nothing. The sheriff uncocks the weapon and pulls it back from the old man's forehead. Now listen, he says. I am a reasonable man. I've been tolerating you white bums jungling up here just as long as you don't do no stealing. But I will not tolerate the likes of that man I saw get off the train. Not in my town. No vagrant Negroes are going to be allowed to come in and stir things up with their ideas. We get along fine with our own coloreds who know their place. They all know Sheriff Dan Boyle is a fair man. Sheriff Boyle makes a circling motion with the gun. Now, I am not saying I'm going to shoot all of you. No, sir. But if y'all don't tell me what I want to know, we are going to burn down every single one of your rotten little shacks, strip the clothes off your backs, beat the bejesus out of every one of you, and then send y'all down the road barefoot and naked as jaybirds. Some of the frightened bows are looking in our direction. There's a slight motion off to my left. Someone under a long pile of leaves is starting to move. I have no doubt who it is. Corporal Isam Dart. About to give himself up. No. Pop hisses. Stay there. As he rises to his knees, his hand reaches out and presses down on my back. You too, Cal. I don't want to, but I do as he says. Pop reaches up to pull back his long black hair and tuck it under his cap. Don't shoot. He shouts. 
I'm coming out. Hands raised above his head, he steps out into the light. All seven men, including Sheriff Boyle, have turned at Pop's first words. Their guns are pointed in his direction as he stands there, totally still. You! The sheriff barks. He grabs the torch from the hand of the man closest to him, steps forward and holds it close to Pop's face, who stays as motionless as the Statue of Liberty. He looks Pop up and down, from his boots to his cloth cap. You're the one I saw hop off in that train? He snarls. Yes, sir, sheriff. Pop says, but I am no Negro, sir, though I am a black. Pop smiles as the sheriff lifts his torch again to study my father. From the look on the lawman's kisser, he's confused. Did he make a mistake because he was so far away? Pop's height and build and even the clothes and cap he's wearing match those of the corporal. With his long hair tucked up, the brown of Pop's face, close to that of a light-skinned Negro, is visible. What are you then, boy? The sheriff says, his voice still hostile. Mulatto? No, sir, sheriff, Pop replies. His voice is soft, conciliatory. Easy mistake to make, sir, but I am an Indian. Full blood creek out of Muskogee, Oklahoma. Pop lowers one hand to take off his cap. Long black hair falls down to his shoulders. As Pop drops that hand holding the cap to his side, the hound that was sitting back on its hind quarters stands up. It walks forward as far as its leash will allow. It touches its nose against the cap, then licks the back of Pop's hand, whimpers, and starts wagging its tail. That's no surprise to me. Pop has this thing about him when it comes to dogs. Even the meanest mutt responds to my father as if he was a long-lost friend. A bit of that seems to have rubbed off on me, as well. The sheriff is looking a bit more at ease. You got a name? He says, his voice no longer a harsh growl. William Black, sir. Veteran, sir. Army papers in my pocket. Got my name on them. Take him out. Pop slips his hand into his jacket to pull out his discharge papers and his compensation certificate. Sheriff Boyle takes them, reads them, nods. So why are you here, boy? He asks. This time his words sound more like an actual question than an accusation. Just stopping over for the night, sir, Pop says. On my way to Oklahoma, up near the Kansas border, taking my son to Indian school there. I may be wrong, but it seems as if I can see the hint of a smile on the sheriff's face. Chelagi, he says. Old Plains View? Pop nods. Sheriff Boyle laughs out loud. That's it, for sure, he says. Every year I catch me a nice little batch of runaways from up there. One year, it was a whole group trying to get back east to their own little reservation in the south. Sheriff Boyle grins, showing white teeth that look as big as tombstones. Nice manners on them, I have to say. None of them Chilagi boys ever puts up a struggle, nor gives any lip when I catch them. He grins at the thought. He squints toward the woods where Pop came out. So where's that boy of yours at? Hunkered down in the brush? Bring him on out. Cal, Pop calls. I stand up and walk into the clearing, stop by my father's side. I reach up for my own cap, take it off, and hold it in both hands in front of my chest. My son, Cal, Pop says. Sir, I say to the sheriff, bowing my head as I do so, and keeping my eyes on the ground. Off to school, huh? Sheriff Boyle says. Yes, sir. You look just like your pa here. Yes, sir. All right, then. He hands Pop back his papers, turns to look around the clearing at the kneeling men, all of whom look considerably less terrified. Now, you bums, Sheriff Boyle says in a loud voice. You all just take a lesson from this man and his boy. They might be Indians, but they know their place. Nice and polite. Just remember, you do see any strange Negroes, you come and tell me right quick, you hear? And be glad you have such a fair-minded man as me keeping the law hereabouts. He waves a hand over his head. Let's go, man. We done here. Pop and I stand stock still, not moving a muscle as the sheriff and his posse of torch-bearing men depart. Nor do the other men of the camp stir from their places on their knees until the bobbing light of their torches can no longer be seen through the trees. Cap is the first to stand. Buckets, he yells, pointing at the little shack set on fire by Sheriff Boyle. Men go scrambling in every direction grabbing pails and throwing the water already in them onto the burning remains of what was once a Bo's home. Too late to save it, 
but soon enough to keep the fire from spreading to the other nearby shelters. We pitch in to help. Takes a while, but eventually the last embers are out. Through it all, there's been no sign of Pop's old war buddy. Go get the corporal? I ask Pop as I stand combing the ashes out of my hair. He tilts his head toward the woods. You can try, but I expect he won't be where you saw him. He's used to making his way through enemy lines. When Pop says that, I get a quick glimpse of the future. I see Corporal Dart walking through the night. He's moving fast, making his way cross-country with no hound on his trail. He'll catch a northbound freight five miles away before dawn. You're right, Pop, I say. What's that, he says. The bright half-moon is at just the right angle now to light the spot where that pile of leaves and debris concealed the corporal. From the limb of an overhanging shrub, there's a glint of metal. I walk over to look. The moonlight is bright enough for me to see what's hung there. The France victory medal that was pinned on Corporal Eason Dart's chest. I free it from the branch. It's cool in my palm. Did he lose it? Pop shakes his head. Nope, Cal, he says. Knowing Isom, he left it there for you. You helped save him. It's yours now, son. All right, that's the end of chapter eight. Answer the questions and write the gist, please.